Always. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? He promised himself to get rid of his country's apartheid system and its nuclear weapons program. Those were the two major goals Frederick de Klerk set for himself as he became South Africa's president in 1989. After negotiations with Nelson Mandela, apartheid was indeed dismantled. But the people here still dealing with its aftermath. Half of the population live in poverty. The fear of violence is endemic, and the political leadership is constantly facing corruption allegations. Today, on Talk to Al Jazeera, former President de Klerk and what happened to the lofty goals of the 1980s. But we begin with nuclear weapons. Today, as the world is dealing with North Korea and looking for a way out, it may be worth remembering that South Africa was the first country to voluntarily dismantle its nuclear bombs. We start by asking him what prompted his country to develop the weapons in the first place. Why did you need the bomb? And did you really believe that one day you might have used that bomb and against who? I don't think we needed the bomb, but some of my predecessors did. I don't think it was ever their intention to use the bomb. They wanted to use it as a deterrent and to strengthen South Africa's international position. When I became, uh, at a fairly young age, Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs, I was informed about this. The whole cabinet never knew about our atom bombs being made at Palandaba. So at the time it was a secret thing? It Nobody only knew on a need to, need, need to know basis people knew about it. Even ministers? Even ministers. Okay. But as Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs I had to know because Palandaba fell under me. And the, uh, uh, the uranium enrichment plant fell under me, so they had to inform me. At that point, I decided quietly in my heart, if ever I'm in a position to rid South Africa of those bombs, I would do so. What was your reaction, first reaction, when you learned, when you were informed about this? I mean, were you shocked? Or? I, was, I was quite shocked, although uh, rumors were flying around in any event internationally and in South Africa. But I was quite shocked to know that, that we've started on that project. When I became president, six and a half of those bombs have been made. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I did was to call that same group on a need-to-know basis together and said, we're going to sign the NPT. Uh, let's plan how we do it. We're going to demolish those bombs and we're going to open up all our facilities for full inspection. And that is what we did. Uh, South Africa uh, was just about the only country that voluntarily gave up its nuclear uh, weapon. How do you think the world would uh, uh, get countries like North Korea and Israel to give up theirs? I don't think there's any quick fix for that situation or a simple recipe. What I do believe in is a nuclear weapon free world. I advocate it and I've done so from many platforms in the past years. Those who have it legitimately in terms of international law and agreements need to be part of the solution. The basis on which, for instance, the USA, England, France, Russia were allowed to have it and continue to have it, but others not, has fallen away. That was how the balance of power was at the end of the Second World War. That balance of power has changed fundamentally. So the starting point for 
a big review of the whole issue of uh, nuclear weapons lies in a new debate, but not just a debate, in a new roundtable discussion to review and revise existing agreements with a view to reach a new agreement which says all those who have it, legitimately and illegitimately, will get rid of it in an organized, methodical way which won't disturb the balance of power. They need to reach a new agreement on denuclearization. There has been speculation that South Africa cooperated with Israel on its nuclear weapons program. This is an allegation de Klerk neither denies nor confirms. I really can't help you in that regard. I know about the allegations that there was close cooperation. I was never part of such cooperation and I never had information which justifies such allegations. Please. But in a recent interview with South Africa's former intelligence minister, Ronnie Casserles told us Israel and South Africa were close partners. It helped South African apartheid create seven nuclear devices. Talk about the concern of the device from Iran in terms of their safety. They showed no, no compunction, no concern or responsibility in terms of putting nuclear devices in the hands of an apartheid monster that was um, threatening the very lives of all the African people of this entire region. I wasn't involved in anything like that and I have never been properly informed about anything like that. So I can't take it further. There have also been reports that South Africa and Israel worked together to test missiles capable of carrying nuclear weapons. I'm not aware of any tests having been done on South African soil uh, of nuclear weapons. Yes, uh, I don't know to what extent Israel was involved, but we did start to develop in the Western Cape uh, a missile program, uh, which never really fully got off the ground. Uh, it was built on the on the south coast of the Western Cape, uh, near a, a, a wildlife reserve. Uh, I know that because I used it in the past, that there's a, a runway which can take a Boeing 707 and the like, but uh, I have not been involved. I can't give any detailed information about that. The code word for the nuclear program was blendava, a Zulu word that means end of the story or the final act. A word that could also be used to capture the end of the apartheid system. When did you realize that it was time of blendava, end of the story, for the whole apartheid system, the regime itself, that it was time for it to go? I did not have a sudden moment when I one night went to bed and thought separate development as we preferred later on to call apartheid is the right policy and the next morning I woke up and said it was all wrong. By 86, I was convinced in my heart that we need to undertake far-reaching and very fundamental steps to change the situation. Was the, that process started uh, based on moral grounds or was it just for pragmatic reasons that you realized that it was, there's no way, there was no way to win that war uh, for, against the, the majority of the for black For most South of Africans? us it was on moral grounds. In the end, I realized that the old system has failed to bring justice to all the people of South Africa. In my younger days, I believed separate development, nation states, some forming something like the European Union, a South African Union, could bring justice to everybody. Mm -hmm. When I admitted to myself, it has failed to do so. I came to the conclusion one cannot continue with a policy which you know leads to injustice to a majority of all the people in the country. And therefore that we had to stop 
trying to make separate development apartheid more acceptable. Mm -hmm. Softening it here and softening it there. We had to abandon the whole concept of division mm -hmm. and in its place put a new concept of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And that was the vision which was developed within the National Party in 1986-1987. We then went to the white electorate in 87 with an election asking for, in broad terms, a reform mandate. Then I became leader of the National Party in 1989. I no longer had to look for a new vision. I've already embraced a new vision of one united South Africa with all South Africans having a vote of equal value, but a new South Africa in which there would be non-racialism, a new South Africa in which no one group would be able to dominate and suppress another group, a new South Africa with a strong constitution which could prevent the misuse of power by any future government. It is with that vision that I entered the presidency in 89. And I saw my challenge and accepted that challenge, that that vision needs to be implemented in practice within one term of office within five years. When I first met the clerk several years ago, he looked forward to a brighter future. Today, South Africa is facing one political corruption scandal after another, often involving the country's leadership. Fear of violence is widespread, so is xenophobia, and many poor blacks are still living in shanty towns. What went wrong uh, since the time we met when you were so optimistic about the future of South Africa? Well, let me start out by saying I'm very concerned about the present state of affairs, but I haven't lost all my optimism. I still believe that the damage which has been done in the past 10, 15 years can be repaired. It will take quite a number of years, but we have not been damaged beyond repair. You ask what went wrong? What went wrong? is firstly that in the field of economic policy making we have diverted from very good well-balanced economic policies which resulted in five percent even up to five percent real growth in the early 2000s and the late 1990s <laughs> and we have disturbed and undermined investor confidence. We're no longer getting the new investments we require to maintain economic growth. Without economic growth, we can't begin to address the problem of extremely high unemployment. Mm -hmm. What went wrong is we had new political leadership in the person of President Zuma, and under him corruption has flourished and cadres have been drawn together, uh, enriching themselves, a small elite, robbing the state institutions like the Electricity Supply Commission, like the South African Airways and other parastatals, mm -hmm. uh, indirectly or directly of money through corrupt transactions and uh, sort of uh, tender procedures which are not being followed. So bad leadership mm -hmm. has led us to a point where the president of the country has lost his credibility. Mm -hmm. With those who don't support the ANC, I think he has fully lost it. Mm -hmm. But within the ruling party, the African National Congress, there's been more than one motion of no confidence mm -hmm. in him from his own people. The ANC is 
being torn apart by faction fighting at the moment, and we don't have clear, well-balanced, credible, and morally sound political leadership in South Africa. It's tragic, but it might change. A political pressure cooker now boiling in South Africa. De Klerk says an explosion can be avoided, but only if the ANC as we now know it is radically changed. What I think will happen is the ANC will split. Because you have in the same party true red communists, you have people committed to free enterprise. Mm -hmm. You have people with totally different ideological and policy principles in which they believe. Too many contradictions within the same a party. Absolutely, and that cannot last. So I see a split, Are we talking and about I see us, and I think that will be healthy for South Africa. Within the ANC Within itself. the ANC itself, apart from the Communist Party, apart from Cosato. Cosato. So, when that split occurs, it will put South Africa in the position that it can normalize its politics away from racially based politics mm -hmm. towards principled basis for politics, away from ethnically driven politics towards policy driven politics, where people who believe in the same things irrespective of race or color can take hands and work together because they believe in the same things. It will be a rough ride to get to that point. Quite a rough ride. Yeah. But I believe that is when we will be break through to calmer waters and when South Africa will get on course again to fulfill its tremendous potential. How do you interpret uh, you know, things like Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, in the United States. And are we seeing the same thing in South Africa differently? Well, racism is a problem in South Africa. It didn't disappear with the agreements which we reached and with our new constitution, which is committed to non-racialism. It exists on all sides. There's white racism and there's black racism. Uh, and in that sense of the word, Yes, it's a problem, like it is in America still, but like it is in Europe and other parts of the world too. Racism is not unique, it just manifests itself in a different way in different countries. South Africa uh, copied many ideas from the United States after the end of the racism system, like the affirmative action. Uh, when do you think we would see an end to uh, this quota uh, system based on uh, color and uh, uh, based on race. When are we coming to see employment, employing uh, uh, somebody just for the mere fact that he or she are good? Well, let, let me firstly say there is a need and room for affirmative action and black economic empowerment in South Africa. That need is acknowledged in the constitution which we negotiated. And the constitution as it stands at the moment says a balance need to be struck between merit, education, training, experience on the one hand, and the issue of black economic empowerment and uh, black affirmative action. Mm -hmm. That balance has not been struck in South Africa. Why? Because the powers that be are developing policies which says irrespective of merit, blacks must be appointed and a certain percentage in a rigid way in each state department must be achieved even though properly trained, available people from a particular group are not available. Mm -hmm. If a country has only so many engineers, let's say 60% of the engineers are white and 40% are 
are of color, then you can't say 75% of the jobs must be for engineers of color and only 25% are for whites. Mm -hmm. There aren't sufficiently trained people of color to fill the posts. So in an unbalanced way, affirmative action has led to bad service delivery, has led to bad management, has led to losses, has led to uh, maladministration of budgets. Not because the people involved are people of color, but because they haven't been trained sufficiently for the jobs that they are appointed to. They're not specialists, but they are put into specialist positions. We can't just carry on and carry on forever on that basis. There needs to be an horizon. In the meantime, we are experiencing a brain drain, not only of white South Africans emigrating, but also of black and colored and Indian South Africans emigrating because they feel that they are not given sufficient opportunity within the economy and the industry of South Africa itself. Being a president and commander in chief, certain uh, operations, both military and intelligence, had to be authorized from you, sir. What uh, were the, the toughest and the most painful operations that you had to authorize, yet you had to, you did? authorize them? Well, the saddest one was I had from both the Defense Force and the police irrefutable evidence, according to them, that a house in the old Transkai Siskai was being used as an arms cache, and that arms from that house have been used in deeds of terror. On the basis of that evidence, I ordered a cross-border offensive to clear up that house. But I said it must go hand in hand with minimum violence and we must prevent people being killed if at all possible. What year was it? This was around about 1992. I can't remember the exact year. Okay. And what happened? They went in, they killed some youths who were there who weren't trained soldiers. And to this day, people are holding it against me. I did it on the basis of objective evidence, and it is a project which went totally wrong. Mm -hmm. I apologized for it, and we saw to it that there were some, uh, that the families of the people were somehow or another uh, helped along. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, in my time, we started withdrawing from where we were. We started demilitarizing the whole situation in South Africa. In my time, I wasn't involved in major operations outside or inside our borders, which I had to authorize. I had to normalize the role of police and normalize the role of the army in no longer playing a political role whatsoever but in just doing what their main tasks are, the police, to protect all South Africans, mm -hmm. their safety and their property and their security. The army to protect our borders and to assist wherever necessary in major operations. What kept you up at night when you were a president? I could fall asleep, wake up the next morning fresh for the new challenges, but what did keep me up now and then was the great responsibility and the realization that in many big issues, there are no easy choices. And that whatever choice you make will also have, apart from positive consequences, some negative consequences. And one needs to live with that. Mr. President, thank you so much thank for you. talking to Al Jazeera.